Well, I'll get things going. Uh, it was a nice introduction. Thank you, Martha. Uh, you guys know who I am, where I'm from. I'm not really a cowboy anymore. I grew up being a cowboy and that's where I learned how to weld was uh, growing up at a feed yard, a couple of feed yards. And uh, I was born in Western Kansas and I grew up in Eastern New Mexico in uh, the cattle feeding industry. And uh, that's what got me started in uh, maintenance was uh, working on front end loaders and feed trucks and all kinds of feed mill and all kinds of stuff. Uh, learned how to weld. My first uh, big welding project was a roping arena. So for whatever that's worth, uh, I know how to weld pipe a little bit. So uh, I do train for LTAP, uh, TPC training, if any of y'all have heard of them, uh, they put me to work sometimes. And then and, uh, a lot of my customers uh, asked me to come in and train their people, um, which I do a lot of that too. And uh, those are some of the people, the Division of Wildlife out here in Colorado. I train a lot of their techs. Uh, I've been to Toyota, train a bunch of quality engineers down there in San Antonio where they make pe uh, pickups. And then of course, uh, coal mines, oil and gas. She covered all that. Today, the main thing is that uh, you came here maybe wanting to know something. If you have a question, I'm not gonna know what it is. So uh, definitely let us know what it is uh, that you wanna know, what you wanna get from this welding webinar. We're gonna cover some safety. I always cover a little bit of safety. As uh, Martha said, we're gonna do dual shield, which is uh, flux core with gas. And then we're doing self shielded as well. Uh, I use videos because they're so much more effective than just talking about it. So uh, there's uh, a guy named uh, Jody Collier that's a retired uh, Delta Airlines mechanic. Uh, he's a CWI, just a prince of a man and a heck of a welding trainer. And uh, he has excellent YouTube videos and a great channel for uh, learning how to weld. And I use a lot of his, uh, his uh, videos. And then we're going to talk a little bit briefly about uh, thermal lance. It's because it's the shortest one to talk about of all the cutting processes. Anyway, uh, maintenance welding, that's where I make my living. Definitely not fabrication. Uh, if you know anything about welding, uh, fabrication is kind of fun and we're using, you know, new material and we're making something uh, usually that's pretty pretty cool uh, maintenance welding we're just putting something back together and uh, somebody broke it so we got to fix it and this is how it is so it's contaminated it's out of position maybe different types of steels we got to weld together maybe we're out there in the elements definitely the unsexy part of welding so uh, i'm gonna start off uh talking a little bit about safety Today we're going to cover the electric shock and uh, uh, proper ventilation, like uh, is in that picture right there in that slide. So uh, let's get the electric shock thing going. I think I got that queued up. I'm going to share that video. Okay, everybody seeing what I'm. Doing? Hello, David. Are you ready to learn about electric shock? Good. Electric shock is one of the most serious and immediate risks facing a welder. You can receive an electric shock when you touch two metal objects that are electrically hot. David, in front of you is a live wire that's been severed. If you were to touch both wires... David, I said if. Please, listen carefully. If you were to touch both wires, your body would experience an electric shock. Thankfully, the voltage across these particular wires is relatively low. But let's pretend for a moment, David, that you are up high, like on a ladder. David, no, don't climb the ladder. I'm saying, let's pretend. If you were high on a ladder, even a low voltage shock could very well startle you enough to send you falling, likely resulting in gruesome permanent injury or even death. 
Don't worry, David. Stu is a cartoon and can recover from any injury. The severity of an electric shock is greatly influenced by the magnitude of the current flowing through your body. Also important to the severity is the type of current producing the shock, alternating current or direct current. Didn't pay attention in physics class, did we? Well, let's try illustrating it another way. This is Brian. Brian is a low voltage direct current. If you were to come into contact with Brian, the initial shock to your body may not be severe. However, if you were to remain in contact with Brian for an extended period of time, the chance of bodily injury increases. Thankfully, you are able to let go of Brian at any time. However, we've invited your friend Ted to be high voltage alternating current. If you were to come into contact with Ted, not only would the initial shock be extremely dangerous, but alternating current can also initiate uncontrollable muscle contractions that can create an inability to let go of Ted and even stop your heart. This is a potentially deadly situation. Go ahead, Ted. I know you don't want to do it, but we're teaching valuable safety lessons here, and it's important to demonstrate so that David really gets it. Thank you, Ted. There you are. You see, David, in welding, you will encounter both alternating current and direct current at varying voltages. All can be very dangerous, even fatal, under certain circumstances. An electric shock received while welding can range anywhere from 20 to 100 volts and is called a secondary or welding voltage shock. The voltage inside of welding equipment, however, is commonly much higher, ranging from 120 to 575 volts or greater. An electric shock of this magnitude is called a primary voltage shock and is more than enough to cause severe injury or death. Now, David, there's no reason to be afraid, but it is important to clearly understand the risks involved when working with electricity so that you can take the proper safety precautions to ensure a long and safe career in the welding industry. Okay, we back on here, electric shock. So I always like to include a little uh, violence in my training. So uh, there you go. We got a little violence for today. That's one of the more entertaining videos that uh, I use. I'm gonna go here and fast forward this one here over to the uh, ventilation. Uh, normally I we watch all of it. There it is, fumes and gases. David, it's all about exposure. There are guidelines for how much exposure to potentially hazardous chemicals is acceptable. In the U.S., OSHA has created the Permissible Exposure Limit, or PEL, and ACGIH has created the Threshold Limit Values, or TLV. This information can be found on the SDS, and keeping your exposure below these numbers will keep you safe. The first and most basic rule is to keep your head out of the plume created by your welding. This may seem obvious, but failure to do so is a common cause of overexposure to welding fumes. This is George. George is an alligator. Imagine George's head is the plume from your welding. Never stick your head in the alligator's mouth. Okay, George, let go. I think he's learned his lesson. Keep your head out of the plume, right, David? Furthermore, you must always ensure proper ventilation. The major types of ventilation are as follows. The first is natural ventilation. If you're outdoors, this would be wind. Indoors, this would be windows and doors. The second type is mechanical ventilation. This would be fans. Finally, local exhaust sucks the fumes and gases away right at the source of welding. Local exhaust can be provided by any of the following. Fume extraction guns, fixed enclosures, downdraft tables, or booths with exhaust hoods, adjustable elephant trunk exhaust systems, 
There are many ways to position an elephant trunk exhaust system, and it depends on your welding conditions and setup, as well as the angle of your weld and your position relative to the work. Determining which type of ventilation is right for a particular welding job is based on the following factors. First, the size and configuration of the welding space you're working in. Next, the number of welders in the space, welding process and current, the consumables used and the material being welded, including paint or plating. And finally, the PEL and TLV exposure limits, which can be found on the SDS. When adequate ventilation can't be provided, you'll need to wear a NIOSH-approved respirator. Don't worry, David. You aren't expected to be able to figure all this out on your own. This is where Dr. Science comes in. Nice of you to join us, Dr. Science. No, Dr. Science, most stylists and manners gurus believe you can never be overdressed. But that's a topic for another set of videos. Let's continue with this video. Whenever you're working with potentially hazardous compounds, an industrial hygienist should sample, measure, and analyze the compounds you're being exposed to while you are welding. Now, David, this is all very official and should make you feel quite safe. But remember, use your common sense and trust your body. If the air you're breathing is not clear, if your breathing air is not comfortable, or you're starting to feel crappy, you may be overexposed. Stop welding and get fresh air. Let your coworkers and supervisor know what's going on. And if symptoms persist, see a doctor. A real Dr. David. Sorry, Dr. Science. Industrial hygienists are respected professional scientists, but they're not medical doctors. And I said this before, I didn't think this was the best name for them. It, it, it's, for one thing, it's not creative. It, it doesn't come off the tongue very nicely. And the people watching this lovely video you're putting together are going to notice that it's, it's poor craftsmanship, really, is what you're talking about here. And you're talking to craftsmen, to, to the welders. They're not going to appreciate this. Yeah, we don't want to offend welders. Heaven forbid. We offend the welders. Okay. There's our safety. Usually uh, when I'm training in person, uh, we have plenty of time and I can cover uh, all the bases. Uh, we cover fire and explosions, personal protective equipment. I think it's pretty obvious uh, when you're welding, you can't look at the arc for various reasons. And uh, sometimes, sometimes it gets loud and you need to wear hearing protection too. PPE. Suffice it to say, if it's not a natural fiber, we don't like it in welding. So uh, wool and cotton are cool. Polyester's horrible. Okay, flux core. It's the reason why we showed up. There's some equipment. I'd like to show some photos here. Give a little uh, love to the guys that make the equipment. This uh, happens to be some Miller equipment. There's the comparable Lincoln. Uh, suitcase welders are common when it co comes uh, to using flux core. Uh, flux core, self shielded flux core, we use it outdoors a lot with a suitcase and uh, one of these kind of rigs. So, as I said, two categories here self shielded is the one we use outdoors, and uh, the uh, shielding gas is produced by the flux in the core of the wire and uh, gas shielded flux core dual shield is uh, kind of a misnomer in that uh, dual and you know meaning that there's two and there's really not two shielding sources at all uh, if you're if you're welding with uh, self shield or gas shielded flux core or dual shield as esob owns that word uh, in in the industry that's what we call it uh, there is no shielding gas other than the external shielding gas that you provide from a cylinder. So uh, Lincoln calls it outer shield. We're gonna look at some videos of both. When it comes to manufacturing the wire uh, and the way you run it, this slide here uh, kind of explains why it is that you run self-shielded flux core one way and gas shielded flux core the other way, that being, if you look at the sheath there, the the uh, thickness of the tube itself, it's a very thin tube and a whole lot of room for powdered metal and flux. And 
alloying materials, all that stuff. There's a lot of room for it in there. So we run self shield of flux core on DC negative. We have a negative electrode and a positive ground when we're running self shielded flux core. And looking over here at the gas shielded flux core, you see the thickness, the wall thickness of that wire is much thicker and there isn't near as much room for flux slag formers, uh, powder metal and that sort of thing in the core of that wire. So we run dual shield wire on DC positive or uh, uh, reverse polarity, which is DC electrode positive, uh, the same way as you would run MIG uh, with solid wire. So dual shield runs the same as MIG on DC positive, self shielded flux core, runs on DC negative. Uh, if you have to change your machine, just remember that because uh, it'll make a mess. We don't care about how stuff's made there. Tubular electrode. Eh, whatever. Let's get to watching some videos here. So we have a tubular wire that's the electrode with flux in its core. Flux is a wonderful thing. I like, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about flux core with you guys, since you work at the DOT or the county or you maintain uh, machinery and equipment, uh, is at some point you're gonna be welding on structural material, something that's structural and that if it breaks, it ain't gonna be good. And uh, we can't have afford, afford for this thing to break. Uh, if you can weld it in the shop, then uh, I encourage my DOT guys and my county boys to, uh, to look at dual shield flux core wire because we've got flux agents in there to help with cleaning, uh, help with penetration. And I trust it more than, than I do MIG. MIG is great for a lot of things, especially fabrication. It's fast, it's clean, there's no slag. But uh, when it comes to structural repairs, uh, if we can have some flux in there, whether we do it with stick or whether we do it with flux core wire, uh, definitely trust a little bit more because of the penetration, because of the cleaning that you can get from uh, fluxes. So uh, um, don't think I'm gonna have time to watch Joel do his five minute uh, basics video. I'm gonna go straight to uh, I believe uh, the Lincoln video where we're gonna talk about troubleshooting. It's a pretty good one. Advantages and disadvantages. Uh, flux core is portable, really portable. That guy's way up high. Could do it outdoors. Uh, it's more efficient. You aren't throwing stubs away like you are with, with stick. High deposition rate, that's for sure. Uh, draft tolerant for sure. Got to be if it's outside. Deep your penetration. Yep, I mentioned that because we do have flux. Some people don't like slag, chipping slag. Well, better get used to it because uh, anytime you have flux, you're going to have slag. Got to chip it away. Definitely more smoke and fumes. Uh, I didn't mention it during the uh, or after the safety video on fumes and, or ventilation, but uh, flux core is probably, flux core and stick are the worst when it comes to uh, fumes and gases. And then of course, if you've ever welded with flux core, you know that it spatters a lot and you can see it right there. This video will show you a little bit about what I'm talking about when it comes to spattering. This is a good Lincoln video. I will try to share it with you here. There it is. You girls, uh, if you're seeing any questions or anything pop up, you're gonna have to flag me down. Hi, I'm Dan Klingman with the Link Electric Welding School. Today, we're gonna go over some troubleshooting of flux cord self-shielded welds. We're going to look at some of the different variables and how they affect the outcome of your weld and what we need to look at to help improve that. The first variable we're going to look at is wire feed speed. Wire feed speed is, is directly related to the current. So the higher the wire feed speed, the higher the welding current, the lower the wire feed speed, the lower the current. 
So we've got our welding machine set for what would be considered a too low of a wire feed speed. And you're going to notice the, the transfer of the droplets is going to be more of a globular type transfer. And we're not going to get complete coverage of the slagging system on top of the weld and a lot of spatter. So we're going to go ahead and make a weld and show you what it looks like when you've got too low of wire feed speed. You'll notice, first of all, it's very hard to get the what little slag that's on there off. And we do have a lot of spatter. And remember we said that wire feed speed is also the current. So low on wire feed speed, we have a very low current here as well. So not much penetration into the base metal and a narrow type B. Okay, the next uh, variable that we're gonna look at for troubleshooting our flux cord cell shielded welds is too high of wire feed speed. Again, we mentioned wire feed speed is going to be uh, is going to be our current. And what's going to happen when we have too high a wire feed speed is you're going to notice the wire wants to keep stubbing. So with that, you can either do one of two things. You either turn your wire feed speed down or you turn your voltage up to correct that. So this weld we're going to make now is an example of too high of wire feed speed. So you could hear that stubbing of the wire. Now, obviously that was an exaggerated uh, high wire feed speed, but that's something that you'll commonly see. It could be to that level or it might not be that, that, uh, you know, that easily uh, seen. Now we're going to look at the effects of travel speed. So what happens when you go too slow or when you go too fast? The first weld we're going to make is at too slow of a travel speed. Now we've set our machine for the factory recommended settings, which is located under the door. And we're going to be set at a wire feed speed of two and a half and a voltage setting of D. And we're going to, all we're going to do is change our uh, travel speed. First one again being too slow. So we made our weld with too slow of a travel speed. And if we look, we can, we can tell we've got a real uh, build up weld or a convex weld, and it's also uh, very wide. And you also notice too, the slag didn't quite cover uh, properly on the weld as well. The next weld we're gonna make is now we're gonna go too fast. We're gonna increase the travel speed. Again, we have not changed our machine settings. All we're gonna do is go faster than what's recommended for this particular weld. You also notice that I'm breaking the wire every time before I start. That's a recommended practice for the self-shielded flux cord wires. It'll get a little ball of uh, silicon on the end and it'll insulate it and it won't allow you to start very well. So we'll just feed on a little bit and break it off and we'll get a better start. We need to show you the right way to get this done. He's showing you the wrong way, to, various wrong ways to do it. And when he says contact tip to work distance, he's talking about stick out. Most people just use the word stick out. And uh, something that I want you to notice here on his technique for uh, flux core is uh, he's letting that he's letting that wire stick quite a ways out from the contact tip. So. Uh, it's something that uh, guys generally don't do when they're flux core welding, so uh, just make note of that. Now this weld, you'll notice that it, uh, it sounded a little different. That was because with that longer uh, contact tip to work distance, you could see the wire was kind of hunting or, or going back and forth. So we weren't getting uh, very consistent feeding 
And you can almost tell that by the way that it made those uh, little ripples in the weld there uh, with just even a straight drag progression. You could see how the wire was kind of hesitating every once in a while. So make sure to maintain that half inch to five eighths. One important thing, another important thing is polarity. Polarity is very important for flux cord arc welding, self-shielded. The recommended polarity for this wire that we're running, 035 NR211MP, is DC negative. A common mistake is that it is, it is often ran on positive, and a lot of times you don't realize what's going on. So I'm going to demonstrate a weld on the wrong polarity, which we're going to run it on DC positive, and notice the difference in the arc. So we just ran that weld on the wrong polarity. We ran it on DC positive. And if you notice, we got a lot of spatter and large balls of spatter, and we got a fairly small weld as well. So we definitely want to make sure that we make sure that we're on the correct polarity before we make the weld. So I just made a weld. You saw what happened when I welded with the flux cord cell shielded on the wrong polarity. Remember the recommended polarity is DC negative or straight polarity. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and set up the machine for the correct polarity. And we can reference up here, it, it says for inner shield FCAW NR211MP, it shows a diagram of the machine setup and the positive and the negative terminals. So for DC electrode negative, it's going to be the lead that's coming from the feeder is going to be put on to negative. And then our work will actually be positive. We'll change these around. Hi, Anthony. It looks like the video has paused again and you are paused. Um, at least you're not in an awkward position with your mouth open like so, um, <laughs> let's see, what do I have? 10 minutes left. I really don't have uh, much in the way of uh, these to uh, share. If you don't mind. Martha, is it okay if I try another video? Because this will be the last one. Okay, let's go ahead and try it. And then if you get kicked off, we'll just um, go ahead and, and stop for the morning. So let's let's try it again. No, that's not how you do it, Tony. Share. This guy gets great art shots. Hey, Jody here with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. This is a continuation of last week's video on dual shield flux core welding. That's that's a gas shielded flux core welding where you use a shielding gas as well as flux core wire that's designed to be run with shielding gas. Now, the reason for this video is I got schooled. I was having to do a lot of manipulation of the electrode to control the puddle. It was wanting to sag out on me. Well, I got a lot of comments uh, and a lot of emails also that were like, Man, you're, you're way off on this one. You should be able to run that, that dual shield flux cord just straight up, no, no electrode manipulation at all, and have it lay down flat, come out like smooth as glass. I called my buddy Andrew Carden, and he schooled me. <laughs> he really did. He said, if you're trying to lower the wire feed speed, that's just going to get worse. He said, you got to crank it up. What I learned happens when you crank it up, you can see the difference in the, in the arc characteristics. It, it all of a sudden, the, the tip of that wire kind of turns into a point and fine droplets just drive into the puddle and the arc force makes the puddle fan out and you get good penetration and a flat well without doing any manipulation at all. So I learned the settings that worked on the particular wire that I'm using today. It's a bowler 
wire. It's a E71T-1 wire 045. That's 1.1 millimeter. And let's let's take a look at the the uh, the weld, the arc, and we'll cut and etch last week's weld, this week's weld. I'll show you the arc shot next to the result of penetration on both. Maybe we'll learn something. Let's do it. This is the weld from last week. It's a vertical T-joint in quarter inch thick metal. And you see I'm making a series of little triangles, trying to stay on the leading edge of the puddle and help the weld flatten out. And it worked okay. Not gonna get any blue ribbons for this weld, that's for sure. It looked like it was penetrating pretty well. I was trying to stay on the leading edge of the puddle, but the outcome is just so-so. I did get a comment on last week's video uh, saying they wished I would have cut, polished, and etched and got a peek at the penetration after I did that weld. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna use this Evolution uh, dry cut saw, and this is not the one that I bought. I wish I bought this one, and I'll tell you why in just a second. The, the clamping mechanism, the vise here is, is cast and precision machined instead of formed sheet metal. And I bought the cheaper version. And after visiting a friend's fab shop who had this one, I wish I'd have bought this one. So a little heads up for anybody. Got a very nice clamping mechanism on this one. I'm gonna let this run real time here just to kind of give you an idea of the actual speed that it will cut metal like this. Again, it's quarter inch metal, so that's roughly six millimeters thick. Took about 30 seconds to get through this whole thing and let, leaves a, a very nice finish. So if you're gonna do a polish and etch, this is a really good way to do it because it takes minimal, minimal sanding and polishing to get something ready to acid etch. And there are lots of different products you can use to reveal the weld nugget. Uh, Naval jelly rust remover works. There's certain types of concrete etch solution that work. I'm, today I'm using a passivation solution for stainless steel and it, it just works really quickly. So we're getting a peek now at four different welds done with four different techniques. And the thing I the think the takeaway here for me is that all of them basically worked at, because, of the, because of the process. It's just a good robust process for penetration and making sound ductile welds. Now here's a peek of the technique I use in the puddle we can correlate that to where I've got the tungsten pointed there. That's a pretty decent little weld nugget. Got a little crown on the weld, nothing too bad. Now, this is where I crank up the voltage and wire feed speed. Remember before I was only running 260 inches a minute, about 23 and a half volts. And it's counterintuitive, but going higher wire feed speed actually helped it lay down flatter. Now this apparatus I'm wearing here, I, I'm doing a valuation for this Optrail E684 weld helmet with a PAPR air supply, filtered air supply on it. And it's too early to tell on that, but I'm getting some time on it and I will comment on that in a, in a future video. But look at that arc driving in there now without me doing any manipulation at all. The whole arc characteristic just changed and I'm actually going fairly slow. I'm not having to go really fast to prevent buildup and prevent crowning. That's a fairly slow travel speed, but you have to hold a really short stick out and you gotta have you gotta have the settings right with enough wire feed speed. One swipe of the chip and hammer, fairly flat weld, much more uniform than before. So now we're gonna cut that sucker in half. And this is the saw that I bought. You can see a whole different clamping mechanism there, much cheaper. And I'm gonna be sorry for that, I'm pretty sure, because I really wanted a, a dry cut saw that would cut some fairly precise angles. Just didn't do my homework. Someone sent me a link uh, for this saw and it was on sale at Amazon, 186 bucks. So I'm not too sad about that. Good price on it, but it's not really what I wanted. For this, it's perfect for, for making, um, in fact, I may just relegate it for doing polish and etch specimens like this. Really quick way to cut, get a good finish, polish and etch. And now let's take a look at the weld nugget. And what you see here is really good penetration, but with a flat face of the weld, no real crown there. And that's sometimes that's a really good thing. Let's correlate it now side by side. Once again, a relatively flat face of the weld with good penetration and almost no electrode manipulation. So just to, to kind of summarize, you can go vertical uphill on certain joints, lap joints, T-joints, and even other joints, multi-pass joints, if you have your wire feed speed high enough and your voltage and, and wire feed speed balanced out and you use a nice short stick out, you can do zero electrode manipulation and still get a flat weld. 
This is J.D. Brewer, uh, owner of Apex Welding Services. I met him at Fabtech in Chicago, and it turns out he's about a Okay, I'm going to cut that short real quick there. Go back to sharing the PowerPoints, right? Okay, thank you, Jody, for that. We're still going, right? Yep, we're still going. The uh, take home for that, for the Flux Core, they did a good job. Uh, I'm sorry that we weren't able to see the uh, the cell shield of Flux Core uh, do it right, but he did it wrong. You notice that there's uh, quite a, a lengthy stick out on that one, whereas on uh, dual shield flux core, where you have a shielding gas, uh, you have a different, uh, you have a shorter stick out on that. So that's one thing. Uh, I wanted you to look at the gun angle, uh, what it's supposed to look like in the in under the hood uh, with Jody's videos, and because uh, uh, dual shield is something that you'll definitely want to. Uh, make part of your uh, arsenal when it comes to welding, if you haven't already. So hopefully you learn a little something about technique and uh, the fact that you turn up your volts and amps when you're out of position, uh, counterintuitive. So um, uh, with that, I think uh, we're sitting here at eight.